Welcome to another tutorial video. This time around, we're going to address a very good question that came in the other day from one of our students about the debt to equity ratio and a company's enterprise value. Now, this question actually came from a real interviewer case study, so it very much represents something that you may encounter in a real interview. Here's this question. If you were asked if debt to equity is on the Y axis and enterprise value is on the X axis, draw the line that would accurately depict the graph. So he's essentially asking, what impact does the debt to equity ratio of a company make on that company's enterprise value? And as he's saying right down here, he thought initially that it would just be a straight line because no matter what the debt to equity ratio is, as long as the total amount of capital stays the same, the enterprise value should stay the same. I'm gonna rephrase this question a little bit to make it easier to explain. As the company's debt to total capital ratio changes, how does its enterprise value change? If you think about it, it's really saying the same thing because if the amount of total capital stays the same, which we're assuming it does, then as the debt to total capital ratio increases, the debt to equity ratio will also increase. So as this ratio, as the percent of debt the company is using increases, how does its enterprise value change? Doesn't it just stay the same regardless of its debt and equity levels? The answer is actually no, or at least not exactly. What this reader thought was happening here looked something like this graph. He thought that, I'll jump into Excel so you can see it a little bit better. He thought that if the debt to total capital ratio went from say 10% to 90%, then the company's enterprise value, which is around 10 or 11 billion here, would stay exactly the same. But that's not exactly what would happen that only really works if you're using the strict accounting definition of enterprise value. What I mean by that is that if you go back to one of our previous lessons, I showed you how even if a company issues shares or repurchases shares or raises debt or pays off debt, the company's enterprise value base multiples will stay the same and its enterprise value will stay the same. But that's strictly the accounting definition. As I mentioned here, we are ignoring the aftermarket effects. We're ignoring the fact that by doing any of this, the company is going to send a certain market signal. And this is the point that this question is getting at. The truth is that this question really tests your understanding of the concepts of cost of equity, cost of debt, and weighted average cost of capital. The question it comes back to is, does a company's capital structure impact its value? And of course, the answer is yes, it is going to impact its value, even though as a simplification to understand enterprise value initially, you assume that debt and equity will add the same amount to enterprise value. The truth is that when you're looking at a company's capital structure, debt is cheaper than equity, but adding more debt to the company will actually increase the cost of equity because by adding more debt, the company has a higher chance of going bankrupt. There are agency costs, there are tax effects. There are a lot of other things that impact this. So it's not as simple as just assuming that debt and equity are created equal. The fact is, as you add more debt, both the cost of debt and the cost of equity will increase. And especially once you start jumping up to much higher levels of debt, say 80 or 90% debt to total capital, the cost of equity is going to jump up to a much higher number. It is always going to be greater than the cost of debt, but it is going to jump up a lot more at those levels. So the correct way to answer this question is that more debt will reduce WAC at first, but then past a certain point, more debt will actually increase WAC. And so what that means is that if you're thinking about a company's implied value, implied enterprise value from a DCF, a discounted cash flow analysis, then enterprise value will increase up to a certain level of debt, but then it'll start decreasing after that. So let's jump into Excel now so I can show you how to think about this. We have here some simplified unlevered free cash flow projections for a company. Don't worry about where these numbers are coming from or anything like that. The point of this exercise is not how to come up with free cash flow projections. It's how to think about this concept of debt to equity, debt to total capital, and the implied enterprise value. So we have a DCF for four historical years and then 10 projected years. And then we have our key assumptions up here, the tax rate, 
the risk-free rate equity risk premium. We have the targeted debt to total capital ratio. I am basing this on a chart over here that shows debt to total capital, debt to equity, and cost of debt and cost of equity as the debt to total capital ratio increases. So that's where all that is coming from. And then to calculate the company's implied enterprise value, this is an unlevered DCF analysis. So all we do is apply a multiple or we could use a growth rate as well to get to the baseline terminal value. We take the net present value based on WAC for the discount rate. And then we sum up the present value of the free cash flows using the NPV function in Excel and this discount rate. So all of this is pretty straightforward and we get to the implied enterprise value like that. Now, if you think about what happens here, even when the debt to total capital ratio changes, the terminal value will not change because this is based on an EBITDA multiple and EBITDA is not affected by interest income or interest expense and therefore will not be affected by the debt to equity ratio. So this stays the same. And then the free cash flows also stay the same because they're unlevered free cash flows. So even if a company has more debt and has more interest expense, unlevered free cash flow will stay the same. So neither one of those components changes. What does change is the discount rate. And if you try some numbers here from the dropdown, you can see what happens. If we go up to a much higher level of debt to total capital, the discount rate increases. If we go down to a much lower level, it decreases. But in the middle of this range, as we go up to say 30%, WAC actually decreases. And here's how that happens. We can calculate based on debt to total capital, what the actual debt to equity ratio is just by doing some simple math here. We just divide the ratio by one minus the ratio to get the debt to equity ratio. And then we relever the median unlevered beta from the comparables to figure out what this is. And the basic idea here is that as a company gets a lot more debt, it's going to get a lot riskier. So it's levered beta or relevered beta here goes up. Also, as it amasses more and more debt, the risk spread and the chances of default on its debt go up. And so the interest rate it's going to pay on its debt also increases. I have the cost of debt here, pre-tax and after-tax. And you can see that as we add more debt, both of these go up. So we know so far that as the company's debt to total capital ratio goes up, its cost of debt is going to go up. That's pretty straightforward. What you may not realize though, is that its cost of equity is also going to go up. This happens because cost of equity is based on the risk-free rate plus the equity risk premium times levered beta. Now these both stay the same, the risk-free rate and the equity risk premium, but levered beta as the company gets more and more debt will go up by more and more. And so cost of equity will go up by more and more. So what ends up happening here is that WAC will decrease up to a certain point, but then when debt stops being beneficial, it'll start increasing again. And so as a result, take a look at our enterprise value over here. I'm calculating this using the exact same formula from our DCF output. I've just listed it a little bit differently, but you can see that it goes up initially and then it starts going down once the drawbacks of debt start outweighing the advantages of debt. And so here's what it would look like on an Excel graph. You can see it goes up ever so slightly closer to around 11 billion once you get to 30% debt to capital. But then once you go beyond that, it starts sloping down and down. And by the time you get up to a 90% ratio, it is actually closer to around eight to 9 billion in terms of enterprise value. And so that is how this concept works. We'd say this is somewhat closer to reality because as a company gets up to a higher and higher level of debt to the point where it becomes dangerous, investors really will start discounting the company and valuing them at a lower level because of all the added risk from that debt. Of course, you could also ask yourself, is this actually true or is this just a different finance theory? And that's a good point. In real life, it's probably not going to happen exactly like this. But what I can promise you is that once you do get up to these very high levels of debt, investors will start discounting the company if they think that there is a high chance of default or bankruptcy or something like that. So the graph may not look exactly like this going back to the original question, but it will look something like this. And that's the most important concept. Debt 
will reduce WAC up to a certain point and therefore increase enterprise value up to a certain point. But then after that point, WAC will start increasing as the benefits of debt are outweighed by the drawbacks of debt. And ultimately, enterprise value will also start decreasing past that point.